Oh, I've been so uh, hiding under my laptop trying to finish a book that this is my first chance to see some friends <laughs> that I haven't seen in a while. I'm like, I'm like where have you been? The problem is me. So. <laughs> this is so fancy. <laughs> okay. So fancy. All this right. Very so. fancy. <laughs> Arm wow. chairs on a stage. I know, right? So the first question I'd like to ask, we were kind of talking a little backstage. Mm -hmm. um, what is your writing process like? Uh, okay, so I, um, it depends on whether you're talking about me in ordinary times or me in deadline hell. Um, right now I am in deadline hell. Um, oh, hey, other people I haven't seen in a while. Um, but right now I am in deadline hell. So right now I'm doing two to 3,000 words a day. Um, usually I've been trying to sleep normally, but when I get super stressed, I don't sleep a lot. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of strange things happening in my life right now. I don't sleep a lot. I don't eat a lot. When I do eat, it's horrible. When I do sleep, it's nightmare filled. Um, it's not good, um, but uh, stress has its effect. Um, so I, like for example, for the last few days I've fallen asleep around 4 or 5 in the morning. Um, I have literally written sometimes until 4 or 5 in the morning, yes. Um, the problem is that I am innately one of those people that is so nocturnal that I like really get going around 1 a.m., but because I'm a grown up and like doctor's appointments and meetings and all this other stuff is at nine or 10, I try to constantly fight myself and not let myself slip into, into uh, nocturnal mode. And, and it's a losing battle because then I just lie awake. I go to bed at like midnight and then I just lie there thinking about stories that I should be writing. Um, so, but lately though, I've been going to bed around four or five in the morning, waking up around 10 or 11, um, eating breakfast, feeding the cats, um, and then I start writing. Um, I've been trying to make sure that I uh, work in time for exercise. I've been trying to make sure, um, because I no longer have a day job, that I leave the house every day. <laughs> um, because when you live and work at home, you can fall into that kind of rut where you don't go outside. You don't realize there's a sun um, or any of that stuff. So uh, I try and make sure that I go for some kind of little walk every day or so. Um, I try and make sure I do at least exercise two days a week, sometimes three. Um, I usually try to do more than that, but when I'm in deadline hell, I'm like just glad to not go into like rigor mortis. Um, and I just write until I'm done. Um, sometimes that means I write for roughly 10-ish to 5-ish, go have dinner, um, relax a little bit, maybe play some video games or something, call friends, remind my relatives I'm alive. Um, and then I come back and write around 1 in the morning and then don't sleep. Um, so that's what it's been. Um, normally, it's not this bad. Normally, uh, I do about 1,500 words a day, and I can, I can pop out 1,500 words in about three or four hours or so. So as, as long as I do all my other stuff during the day, I can also still get 1,500 done. So listening to that was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Mainly for personal reasons, because I'm, I'm writing my dissertation, oh, no. and I'm like, we are in the same struggle. Oh. It's awful. Yeah, but this did start in grad school, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> so we're just going to move along. <laughs> as I. <laughs> so how do you know when you have something? Hmm. Pardon me? Your question should be longer. Um, uh, I don't. Um, a lot of times when I get an idea, uh, well, first of all, I tend to get ideas when I'm in the middle of doing something that has a deadline and needs to be done. Um, like I have a great idea for a new novel right now. I got two more books to go in this trilogy, and I haven't even finished the first book yet. Um, so this, is, this always happens to me. I get the idea for a new novel when I've got like two more years worth of work due on another thing. Um, so I have written down this idea to the degree that I can. I will revisit it later. If it survives the, the conflict of my current trilogy, then I will know that it is, it is an idea that has some legs. But even then, um, I write test chapters to try and figure out, like, what's the right voice, what's the right direction to go in. So. Okay, so um, I read your original essay, How Long Till Black Future Month, um, from 2013. Mm -hmm. And can you explain a little how the um, essay evolved into this um, collection? 
Uh, well, first of all, the essay is not in this collection because there are no essays in the collection. Um, and also because it is a shameless fangirling of Janelle Monet. Um, and, and it wasn't really quite How on topic. How could you not? Granted, granted, I believe 100% that that is true. Um, but it was a little off topic. Um, so uh, it is an essay where I'm talking about my engagement with science fiction um, as a black woman and how Janelle Monet and other Afrofuturistic um, icons, musicians, filmmakers, whatever, helped me see a space for myself within it. Um, and so in the essay, and you can find that for free on my website. Um, I should probably bump it up higher somewhere so it's easier to find on the website. Well, anyway. Um, you can just help. Google it. Yeah, you can do that. Why don't you do that? Um, but it's literally the same as the title of the book. Um, but uh, the... What I'm talking about, for example, is like the Jetsons and how, as a kid, I love the Jetsons. Um, and yeah, the Jetsons is a little before my time, but syndication is your friend. Um, and so I grew up watching the Jetsons and thinking, OK, one day we'll all live in this wonderful future where we're flying around in these nice cars and we've all got robot butlers. Um, and I do have a Roomba. But um, <laughs> and, and you know, so on. But um, as I got older, it suddenly started to occur to me that there's nobody black in the Jetsons world. Um, and they all live in this city above the clouds. And we don't know what's going on beneath, beneath the clouds. And I started to want, like, even the robot is white. So I started to wonder, oh, is that where they are? Throughout the Jetsons, is, is this wonderful, happy utopia um, masking a horrifying dystopia beneath the clouds? Um, so, so I began to realize that, that science fiction, again and again and again, was filled with these unspoken, silent, deeply disturbing dystopias and, and Apocalypses, um, you know these these genocides that no one ever mentioned, um, and so you know that was one of the first places where I started to kind of disengage and start to, started to realize just what was wrong with the genre. Um, but people like Janelle Monet and I was talking about her video Many Moons, I think, throughout that essay. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's wonderful. It's about a robot fashion show. Do not take that as a, a, a limiting description but go see it and watch the video and dance. <laughs> OK, so um, in the introduction to this collection, you call Janelle Monáe an Afrofuturist icon. Mm. So how do you define Afrofuturism in the context of your work? And what do you ultimately want your work to accomplish? Um, oh. Um, my apologies. Uh, okay, so when I grew up, Afrofuturism meant something entirely different from what it seems to mean now. And the, the meaning, as we discussed in the back room, the meaning is changing still as we speak. Um, and so I have kind of disengaged with, like, when people ask me, are you Afrofuturist? How are you Afrofuturist? I'm like, I don't know. Um, that is, I'm going to write what I write. When I die, academics will figure it out. Um, and... But, <laughs> Damn. <laughs> like, let me die first. <laughs> but, um, anyway. I'll just be there waiting. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, I'm going to make sure I exercise tomorrow. All right. Um, um, <laughs> give me some time. Um, anyway, uh, so... Um, when I was younger, Afrofuturism meant visual stuff and auditory stuff. It was not fiction. Um, it was music like Parliament Funkadelic. Um, it was movies like The Brother from Another Planet. Um, and so, and, and that's what it has always meant to me. Um, and I haven't really fully updated with it. You know, when people started applying Afrofuturism to me, I'm like, I can't sing, um, you know, or whatever. You don't want to hear me try. Um, and so um, 
So basically, Janelle Monet to me felt like modern Afrofuturism. She felt like a descendant of Parliament to me, um, funk included. And so, you know, that is what I think of when I think of an Afrofuturistic icon: is someone whose videos and visuals and lyrics are all challenging to the idea that we don't have a future, that we're the people beneath the clouds and the Jetsons. Um, so, um, or that beneath the clouds we aren't partying, um, that you know we're not suffering in. in in some way. That is what Afrofuturism is supposed to posit, um, that we have a future. Um, and that's really all I expect. So um, I suppose if that is the definition that we go by, then of course she counts. So in your uh, most recent Hugo win of the three, you said, life in a hard world is never just struggle. How do you weave that into your fiction? Uh, there's a thing that I've been struggling with now, which I suspect all of you have, um, which is the apocalyptic hellscape that we now live in, um, which is could be so much worse, granted. Um, but you know, we were we were having a conversation in the back room, um, and if you pardon me for jumping ahead there, um, you were talking about how you teach your freshman students, uh, the ones who walk away from Omalas, um, and how they're not horrified by it. And my immediate thought, and, and I said this to you, was they live in Omalas. Um, there's no reason for them to have the reaction to this idea when all they have to do is open up Twitter and it's about the latest sweatshop that someone has, has busted down um, that was making the, the clothes that they're wearing or the shoes that they had on, um, where there was a child in a closet forced to work, probably. Um, so, you know, it's we all live in Omalas. There's no walking away from this anymore. In Le Guin's day, um, you know, there were communes. There were there was there was a, the idea that you could somehow walk away from it. It was not my time. I'm speaking of what I think it was like. You know, anybody that was there can speak to that for me. Um, but in those days, in the days that the the ones who walk away from Omalas was written, the idea that you could walk away was still reasonable. Um, but, you know, I don't think that that's a thing anymore. I think we have to learn to survive an omelas and keep ourselves together enough that we can eventually fix it. So, um, and that's basically what I'm, I'm constantly struggling with is, how do you find joy when you live in Omalas? When you know that somewhere out there there is a child in a closet? When you know that there are kids being uh, gassed with tear gas? When you know that there are children who've been taken from their parents? All these other horrible things. When you are constantly living with that awareness, you cannot allow the misery of it to, to be the only thing that you think about, or you will not survive. You will, you will not make it. Um, and my father, who lived through Jim Crow, um, he's 76. Ooh, don't tell him I don't remember. Um, but anyway, um, dad is, is 76, um, grew up in Birmingham in the days of Bull Connor. Um, and dad has been trying to kind of counsel me on, yeah, as, as we slip more and more back to the place that I thought that we were done with, um, what you have to remember is that the thing that will help you survive is forging relationships with other people, remembering to laugh, remembering to love, remembering the joy that is part of human existence. Um, because those will strengthen you and give you the energy that you need to fight against the horrors. Um, and so that, for me, is what it kind of comes down to, is I've got to remember that there is joy. I've, I've got to f constantly remind myself that there is joy, um, because that's how you fight back. Um, having that joy, not letting other people step on your joy, um, is one of the ways that you gain the strength to do the things you need to do to fix Oma loss. So. So that's actually a great segue um, to talking about the ones uh, who stay and fight. Mm. And so you call that a reaction and a, p a pastiche to um, the ones who walk away from Omelas. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and why you decided to write that? Uh, well, I kind of answered that already. Um, hmm. um, yeah, I mean... What it boiled down to was, like I said, I, I didn't think walking away from Omalas sounded like a viable option anymore. Um, 
I compare Omelas actually against Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, um, which I recently re audiobook read. Um, Partly because I'm I'm writing a, a, an introduction to a new reissue of it soon, but also just because it's time. Um, if you have not reread *Parable of the Sower* and *Parable of the Talents*, you need it. You need to read it right now. We are living in the stuff that she envisioned, um, and she has some strategies. So, um, and and some of what she talks about and some of the suffering is hard to hear. I'm not even going to lie. Um, if you're in a in, if you're in a dark place, maybe don't read it just yet. Wait till you're a little up, a little more up. Um, but but the, the strategies and the things that she talks about um, are not necessarily directly advising advisory. Um, one of the things, for example, that happens in Parable of the Talents, and I'm not going to spoil it, I'm just simply saying, um, super brief. Um, one of the things that happens in Parable of the Talents is that the protagonist attempts to walk away. Um, literally does attempt to go away from the, the horrors that she's seen and create a community um, in an isolated place with people that she cares about. And it's working beautifully until a bunch of horrible people show up and really bad things ensue. They walk away and the horror follows them. That is what's going to happen these days. There's no walking away. The only thing that we can do is fix what we got. We can't just leave it. So I started to try and engage in that case um, with what it will take to fix th what we have right now. And, and there are, I don't want to spoil the story for people. Um, there's an argument to be made for how I'm using violence in the story. My feeling is we see violence being enacted all the time around us right now. We are hesitant to talk about whatever violence might be necessary to save lives. Um, we seem okay with the violence necessary to take lives for spurious reasons. Um, we do not seem okay with the violence that might be necessary to defend. Um, and previous generations, oh, I bit my tongue. Um, previous generations um, resolved this conflict with wars. Um, I hope that it doesn't come to that. I pray it doesn't come to that. Um, I want nothing but uh, anything but that. Um, but our acceptance of violence right now is wrong, and there are there are conversations to be had and thoughts to be thought. So, this story is my attempt to think that thought. So you call um Halat the um setting. The city. Yeah. Mm -hmm of um, the ones who stand fight a post-colonial utopia. Is a utopia possible? Uh, well, I mean, I don't believe that utopia is, is a noun. <laughs> um, I think there's no such thing to get, uh, no such thing as a place that all people will find pleasant. Um, one person's utopia is going to be somebody else's utterly miserable hell. Um, that's unavoidable. That's just because we're all different. We all perceive the world in different things. We all want different things. Um, but Umhalat is a place where everybody gets food, everybody gets education, everyone has a chance at fulfillment. Um, Everyone, for the most part, most people are fulfilled. Um, and I, I wrote that story partly because I was, re I realized, oh, somebody get it. Um, but anyway, I realized as a science fiction writer, I was having trouble, science fiction and fantasy writer, sorry. Um, I use SF as generic uh, shorthand. Um, but as an SFF writer, I was having difficulty imagining what a world without bigotry would be like. And I'm black, and I write science fiction, and I couldn't envision it. And even in this story, it's not a world without bigotry. It's a world that used to have bigotry that fixed it. Um, and even that was a struggle to write. I had to use Le Guin's framework to do it. So it's very much an homage to Le Guin um, because she attempted to do uh, that long before I ever had the, the chops to even try. And you know, there's a whole part of me that's like, oh my god, how dare I attempt to walk in the footsteps of greatness. Um, but I did. And it's up to you to decide 
<laughs> it's up to you to decide whether I earned that. Um, it's entirely possible that I didn't. Tell me. I'm fine with that. That's how you get better. So I need that feedback, um, and, and I will try again. So anyway. Well, I loved it. It's one of my favorites. And I loved Omelas as well, but I think they would make a really good pair in a classroom. Hmm. Um, So speaking of stories I loved, I also loved Cloud Dragon Skies, which made me wonder if you are as annoyed about all of the Mars colonization talk as I am. Uh, We we talked about these these questions beforehand. Okay, so the Mars colonization talk is when certain, certain billionaires <laughs> whose names rhyme with peon fucks <laughs> and other billionaires with other names um, suddenly become enamored of the idea that we don't have to try and fix climate change. We don't have to make a world that everyone can survive in and be happy in. We can just like fuck everybody and the rich people will run off to Mars um, with their chosen servants um, who are probably going to be fitted with slave collars or something. Um, there's actually an, there's an article that's going around and I've forgotten the name of it, but it's a, an article that I uh, saw, I want to say on Tumblr anyway, um, talking about the fact that that um, there was a there was a woman who was giving a presentation to a bunch of billionaires about technology that could be usable in the future, and and she slowly realized that the billionaires were all thinking in terms of the world is doomed. I just want to figure out how to create my little island paradise for myself, my compound, my walled armed compound where I can live. And their questions were all along the lines of, well, how do I force my servants to obey me when there's no food left anymore and when the world is destroyed, when when there's nobody left but me and them, there's going to be a lot more of them than me. How do I force them to, to obey me? They are literally talking about escaping the earth and leaving us all to rot. So, um, yes, it annoys me. Um, and, And these are in many cases some of the same people who their business practices, their their lobbying for changes to laws and so on, are enabling the destruction of the world that they are so eager to leave behind. Um, and it is on us to do something about that. We don't have um, mustache twirling uh, super villains who who uh, have bald heads and you know um, whatever visual cues that we've been told to expect evil to look like. These people look great. They can afford plastic surgery. Um, these people do not look like the the megalomaniacal monsters that they are, but they are. And they are destroying the world, and we have to stop them. We have to do something. So, you know, we, we're, uh, there, there have been some steps made in that direction. Um, I am pleased with the midterms results. I would like a lot more happening. Voting is not enough. Voting is one of the things we got to do. We got to do a lot more than that. Um, and I'm, I keep getting on soapboxes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. No, I think we're enjoying it. But um, to lighten things up a little bit, <laughs> there, there are a few different types of dragons in the collection. What is your favorite mythological creature? As I said earlier, my favorite is the Pegasus, but with the horn. Winged unicorn. Okay. Is it a Pegasus if it's a winged unicorn? I feel unicorn? like it is a Pegasus. I don't know. I is there like a specific, like... I don't know. Is there, is there a specific a term for a winged, for a winged unicorn? unicorn? Versus gonna, a of course you would alicorn. know. <laughs> no, but an alicorn is one horn. That's my friend Kirk. That's, of course it, he it would It might not know. have wings. It might not have wings. Uh, we, I'm going to Okay, this look is at, deep. Yeah. <laughs> this I'm going to find the answer, okay. and I'll get back to you. Is it a winged there. unicorn, or is it a horned pegasus? I feel like winged mm. unicorn just sounds better. Than horned Pegasus. That sounds, it does, does that make it sound like that threat. Pegasus is, is having some issues. Um, <laughs> needs a date. Um, poor a Pegasus. <laughs> but, uh, so, so yours? Um, uh, my favorite are dragons. Um, I, I, 
actually, um, I've been replaying Dragon Age Inquisition lately, uh, and I... <laughs> Uh, I can't. I can't talk about this. Um, <laughs> I have some issues with Inquisition. DA2 is the greatest game in the franchise, um, but Dragon Age Inquisition's um, sort of best op- best thing is that you can choose to go fight a bunch of dragons, just for shits and giggles. It's an optional fight in the. It's a bunch of optional boss fights, and the dragon takes up the entire screen, and you are like this little character here, and the dragon is like this big and you're like pew pew at the dragon (laughs) and it takes like 20 or so minutes to fight every dragon because it's a a war of attrition but if you persevere and if you continue to look out for your your comrades there's all kinds of metaphors in this and if you continue to look out for your comrades you can bring the dragon down and and I need that inspiration. I need like casual uplifting violence (laughs) to get me through my day. (laughs) We all cope in different ways. So when I asked her this (laughs) earlier, her response was, dragons, because they stomp on stuff and breathe fire. (laughs) I mean, that too. That's important. That's important. Yeah. So um, dreams and memory come up in a lot of your, your stories. Why is that? I mean, I read somewhere that a lot of your um, ideas come from dreams. Mm. So you just keep weaving that in. Um, Well, I feel like, first off, dreams are such good inspiration. Um, In fact, my my, um, friends have been tormenting me all day because I, and I actually posted about this on Twitter, um, but I, I texted them this morning mad because I had dreamed that someone made a sequel to Highlander 2. <laughs> the one we don't that. talk about. <laughs> and um, don't ever watch Highlander 2. If you haven't seen it, it doesn't exist. Um, but in my mind, in my subconscious mind, Highlander 2 existed. Um, and I don't remember what the movie was about. I just remember being in the audience furious that I couldn't get out of the auditorium. And I was forced to watch this movie. Um, And so my friends started bugging me. They were like, well, what was happening in it? How could you fix that? We know you can do it, Nora. Your subconscious is on the case. And I'm like, I don't want to. No, no. Um, But I mean, this is the thing. My subconscious burps up all kinds of interesting stuff. And my job as as a fantasy writer, I'm switching back and forth between calling myself a science fiction and fantasy writer, um, but my job as a fantasy writer is to use the stuff of myth. The stuff of myth is dreams. The stuff of myth is is the the iconography that the zeitgeist gives us, zeitgeist gives us, um, and which our minds kind of churn through. Um, that is where human storytelling comes from. Um, so, you know, I, I, and I did do when I was, um, uh, a younger, when I was a grad student, actually, um, I did for a while attempt to do lucid dreaming. Um, which is a technique that you can use where you are yourself in your dream and you are in control of the dream. Um, you're not just kind of like a person watching yourself do things. You you can stop and, you know, it starts with little techniques like, um, you know, reaching your hand from here to here. You know, just doing something as simple as that while you're in a dream. If you tell yourself in a dream, I'm in a dream. I'm going to move my hand, and that's it. And then you can just be along for the ride from there. Um, you you also start by like waking up in the middle of a dream and writing down a dream diary, um, little things like that. Um, so I spent a while kind of trying to master dream techniques, and and the dream blood books came partly out of that. Um, was me, you know, thinking of ways in which, well, if I could master the skill, I could rule the universe. Um, no. Um, but if I could master the skill, you know, if other people could master the skill, what if there was magic in it? What if blah, blah, blah. Um, so, I mean, I just feel like that's, that's my job as a fantasy writer is to find ways to use that kind of mythic burp back um, and see what I can do with it. Mythic burp back. I like that. I don't like the burp back part of that. I don't know. I'm going to find a better word. It's very visual. Uh, I mean, kind of in a gross way, I yeah. agree, but... Still. I'll find a better word. So, um, are there any stories that you had a hard time leaving out? Um, my, my flippant answer to this is no, because I left out all the stories I didn't like. 
Um, but I had an experience not too long ago, about two weeks ago, where I was on LeVar Burton Reads. Um, some of you may have heard that. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. I got to meet LeVar Burton this week. Anyway, um, I didn't squee at him. <laughs> Quite proud of myself. Managed to stay cool. Um, and then afterward, I was like, oh my God. Um, but anyway, and I sent my friends uh, uh, my selfie with LeVar Burton, like, oh my God. Anyway, um, so, uh, but I was on Lover Burton Reads, and he picked a story of mine that I left out of the collection. Um, he picked uh, Playing Nice with God's Bowling Ball, which I never liked. Um, I wrote it just kind of like to see if I could write old school science fiction, um, what, what in my mind was old school science fiction. Um, and also, like, I'd, at the time, I was, I think I was... Um, I was working basically so much that the only thing that I could do when I got home, um, I had actually kind of stopped writing during that period. The only thing I could do when I got home was um, watch Law and Order and go to bed. And so Law and Order bloomed in my head as like a, a source of fantasy because I had nothing else. Um, and so it's literally just me trying to add science fiction and fantasy to Law and Order. Uh, I guess it was fanfic, really. Um, but anyway, so um, I didn't think it was a very good story. And he read this story, and I'm sitting there like, oh, <gasps> you know, I'm like, I'm into this. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is really good. Oh, my God. Oh, no, poor Timmy. Um, and, and then I remembered I had written this. <laughs> Um, so I feel bad now that I left that story out of the collection. <laughs> I guess I'll have to put it up on my website. Um, it is. Oh, wait, I forgot. Okay, well, there you go. Thank you. Who works for Kaleidocast right here? Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's, that's an idea. Okay. LeVar Burton is magical. Yeah. Um, so for everyone who can't see... Um, you are wearing a Wakanda Forever sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so fitting because one of the questions that I planned was, was Killmonger right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I disagree with the execution. Um, um, but I mean, it, he, he's asking the same question that I think that the story of the ones who stand and fight, who stay and fight, um, it's asking the same question. Um, and like I said, there's something curiously disturbing about our willingness to accept uh, violence in the name of a distant corporation that wants us to go over and win oil rights, um, or, or never mind rights, just take it. Um, there's something wrong with us being okay with violence to, to stop refugees, women and children, sick, pe sick people, um, starving people trying to come and just get a better life. There's something wrong with us being okay with that violence but not with violence against the people that are doing these things. Um, now, I'm not advocating violence. This is where, where I say I have an issue with Killmonger's choice of methodology. At the end of the moment, um, I think that um, T'Challa had the right compromise. Um, he recognized that Killmonger was right. He also didn't want to murder a whole bunch of people. I'm okay with that. Not murdering people, Awesome. Um, but doing something, um, as opposed to just kind of hunkering down and trying to survive. Um, like I said, we're all living in Omelas. We've got to find a way to change it. So. Well, I think that's a good place to end right there. Um, um, I, I had a piece I was going to read, but I mean, it was going to be super short. Um, and then, okay, wait, and how, much time are, how, yeah. do, how much time do we have for questions, though? minutes. I think you should read. You know what? I think we should go straight to Q&A. Oh, okay. I don't think that's... Oh. Okay. <laughs> Damn, y'all. Um, all right. Um, and you know, I was waffling all this time, and I'm, I've decided... But I'm now you read, have to. I've decided I'm going to read the first page of, um, of uh, The Ones Who Stand and Fight. So, um, this is my favorite one. Let's see, there's a good stopping point. Right? One more. 
All right. Um, this is the first two pages of the ones who stand fight. It's the day of good birds in the city of Umhilat. The day is a local custom, silly and random as so many local customs can be, and yet beautiful by the same token. It has little to do with birds, a fact about which locals cheerfully laugh because that too is how local customs work. It is a day of fluttering and flight regardless, repentance of brightly dyed silk plume forth from every window, and delicate drones of copper wire and feather glass, made for this day and flown on no other, waft and buzz in the wind. Even the monorail car cars trail stylized flamingo feathers from their rooftops, although these are made of feather glass too, since real flamingos do not fly at the speed of sound. Umhalat sits at the confluence of three rivers and an ocean. This places it within the migratory path of several species of butterfly and hummingbird as they travel north to south and back again. At the day's dawning, the children of the city come forth, most wearing wings made for them by parents and kind old aunties. Not all aunties are actually aunties after all, but in Umhalat, anyone can earn auntiehood. This is a city where numberless aspirations can be fulfilled. Some wings are organza stitched onto school backpacks. Some are quilted cotton stuffed with dried flowers and clipped to jacket shoulders. Some few have been carefully glued together from dozens of butterflies' discarded wings, but only those butterflies that died naturally, of course. Thus adorned, children who can run through the streets do so, leaping off curbs and making whooshing sounds as they pretend to fly. Those who cannot run instead ride special drones, belted and barred and double-checked for safety, which gently bounce them into the air. It's only a few feet, but it feels like the height of the sky. But this is no awkward dystopia where all are forced to conform. Adults who refuse to give up their childhood joys wear wings too, though theirs tend to be more abstractly constructed. Some are invisible. And those who follow faiths which forbid the emulation of beasts, or those who simply do not want wings, need not wear them. They are all honored for this choice, as much as the soarers and flutterers themselves. For without contrasts, how does one appreciate the different forms that joy can take? I'm going to stop there. Um, that is... Oh. Um, as I said, that is a that is a pastiche. It is from a story that is meant to be a pastiche of uh, Ursula Le Guin's uh, "The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas." If you have not read that story, please do read it before you read "The Ones Who Stay and Fight," um, because it's it's meant to be in conversation with Le Guin's story. Um, I mean, I, it stands on its own, but it works better with Le Guin. So. We've got about uh, 15 minutes for questions. If you raise your hand, I'll bring you a mic, and if we can get the thing going. Hi. Hmm. Following up on your comments about tusks, I was wondering whether you had a take on the Ray Bradbury story where all the black people about go to tusks? Mars to escape. Oh, the other foot. I love that story. There you go. I'm sorry, tusks? You, you, you were talking about going to Mars, billionaires going to Mars. Bradbury writes a story. Oh! oh. <laughs> you didn't want to mention it? <laughs> no, I was, I was a little confused. Okay. okay. Um, but I'm asking you about a different version of that story by Bradbury where black uh -huh. people go away, enough of this stuff, yeah. white people try to stop them. But it's an interesting contrast to the story you just <laughs> mentioned. I read that story probably 20 something years ago and I don't remember it well. Um, and it, it's kind of part of a whole, there, there has been a, a genre of, of speak back um, against that story written by black writers. So I remember their stories better than I ra remember Bradbury's story. Um, you know, I mean, and there's really before that, um, which one, Derek Bell, Space Traders? Yeah. Was that before Bradbury or? Okay, so that was the first of the, the responses. Okay, so there's a whole genre of black, black writers who read that story and were like, no, um, and, and had some issues with it. I remember having issues with it. I have not read the story in half my lifetime, so I'll have to try it again at some point. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Hi. 
Hey, so uh, Omelas was Salome, I think. Uh, like S A L O M E. Oh, is where really it was from. it? Yeah. Okay. So I was wondering if Omelas had a, I guess not, like a similar. I had intended for it to sound like Omelas, but oh, be okay. Omelas. If you say it gotcha. fast, it's like okay. Omelas or whatever. Right. Okay. I mean, that was in my head. Okay. Um, and then um, a couple of people that I know who are familiar with Arabic were like, you know, that means something, right? And I was like, uh. And I don't remember what it means, honestly. Is there anyone in here who, who, um, Okay, guess not. Um, so apparently it means something in Arabic. I have no idea what it means, and I did not intend for it to mean anything. I was literally just trying to use the word umhalat, I'm sorry, omelas, okay. in a different form so that people would get the pastiche, as if it wasn't like a brick to your face, obvious already. Um, okay. But, you know, that was it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing, I'm not that deep. <laughs> um, so. So, hi, how are you? How I'm good, how are you? I'm a huge fan. <laughs> yes, nice, thank nice you. To this is a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> this is Terry Clark, who's all, another black writer who has many stories out, or well, has a few stories out. I did should... not sign up for this. Well, see, <laughs> you Damn. had to pick up the microphone. <laughs> I wasn't going to call you out. Anyway, um, but she is another up and coming black writer who you should read. I will leave it at that. <laughs> Thank, thank you. Now that I'm sweating into the mic, um, I was actually going to embarrass you. Oh, well then. <laughs> um, preemptive strike. <laughs> pre exactly, preemptive strike. <laughs> okay. um, I really wanted to embarrass you as well as I'm going to have a question, but mm. um, I've told you this before, mm. that it was, while I love Octavia Butler and mm. she is, you know, a god to me, mm. it was your um, Hundred Thousand Kingdoms that... Mm gave me the courage to start writing my novel and was what that. literally told me mm. that I can do this mm. because reading other science fiction and fantasy, mm. I was overwhelmed with the prospect, mm. um, but seeing how you handled it and now I'm going to probably start crying, <laughs> um, but it like being able to read that and to mm. continuously read your work, I almost text you just now, the amount of times I almost text you reading The Broken Earth, like... <laughs> I was ready to yell. But I'm, I mean, I'm so glad you did. But okay. um, I actually but, did. Like throughout my writing career, I have had my friends. I tell them not to read my books, <laughs> and they don't listen. And so then I get this text at 3 a.m. from people who have my the ability to text me at 3 a.m. going matting. Yep. Everybody's exactly. still mad about matting. Anyway, but, um, um, my other, no my, I guess my kind of question, mm. thank you, by mm. the way, just thank you for being awesome. Oh, well, um, and I guess my question at this point is, I am very much like burn it down pookie. Mm. Like I mm. have the novelette that's, or novella that is going to be coming out soon. Sorry. Mm. Um, is, Where? I can't say anything yet. What's it? Oh. It's it's called Flowers for the Sea, and oh. it's about a pregnant black woman on a boat, flooded earth, mm. um, and she's angry. Mm. She's very angry, and she's very unlikable, and, but at the end, she's very, well, I'm not going to give spoilers, but she, she does have the attitude of very much um, mm. burn it down pookie. Mm. Um, and I was just kind of wondering, how do you, because you manage to avoid doing that so well, <laughs> and where it feels like, especially in 100,000 Kingdoms, mm. where it was that moment of, mm -hmm. that big moment, mm. where I definitely wanted to text you, mm -hmm. like, how fucking dare you? Oh, I hope there's no children. Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, but short. But yeah, okay. but um, mm -hmm. yeah. So it like okay, I'm done. I promise. But yeah, how do you how do you kind of avoid being like I am going to have only one character survive everything? <laughs> uh, well, I remember that my friends have my number and can text me at three in the morning, <laughs> um, and I have to live with the consequences of every character that I kill, which is that they text me at three in the morning. Um, but anyway. Um, in a lot of cases, I displace 
um, the most violent acts from my protagonist. And it's a thing that I'm noticing about myself, a thing I'm beginning to understand about myself. Um, and I am beginning to question um, this tendency within myself because it feels like a cop-out. Um, so, for example, in The Broken Earth, um, Essen is not the one who destroys the world. Um, she's got all the reasons. Um, she doesn't actually do it. Um, so, a uh, spoiler alert, that happens on page two. <laughs> um, so, um, and it's a thing that I have to kind of wrestle with. It's a thing that I'm not sure how I'm going to resolve. Um, but that is one of the ways that I deal with it, is that the, the worst acts are not, in a lot of cases, committed by my, my protagonist. But that's also because, in a lot of cases, my protagonists are trying to find a way for, to, to maximize survival for themselves and others. They're past the burn it down stage into the how do we survive it stage. Um, and I'm not as interested in the burn it, burn it down stages. I guess I used to be maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Um, you know, I, I, you know, there's there's a saying that you grow more conservative with age. I'm just like less prone to burn it down. I don't know if that counts as less conservative or more um, progressive. I don't know what's more radical. Um, but these are all questions that I constantly ask myself. I have no answers. Sorry. Okay. Uh, um, hi. Yes, hello. Um, I have a question. First of all, I'd like to um, apologize in advance because I'm going to bring up Afrofuturism. I know you're kind of hesitant mm -hmm. about that word. But, yeah, um, can you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry, the, the air conditioner here. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Much better. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to um, apologize in advance because I'm going to bring up the word Afrofuturism again, and I know you're kind of hesitant about it. Mm -hmm. But um, my question is, um, what do you think of the trend of Afrofuturism entering the mainstream? Uh, there's been Black Panther, and there's mm -hmm. been films like uh, Sorry to Bother You, and Janelle Monae's recent Dirty Computer, and mm -hmm. even stuff like the new A Wrinkle in Time adaptations getting branded as um, Afrofuturism. And I was is wondering- Is that being called Afrofuturism, too? Yeah, I've seen it be called Afrofuturism, which is kind of weird. Um, yeah. Um, again, my questions are: um, What do you think of these works, and uh, what do you think of? Do you see the uh, Afrofuturism becoming more of a mainstream thing as a good thing, or do you think it has like sort of some uh, caveats behind it? Very good question. Um, and I am possibly going to get angry here. <laughs> um, there's a thing that happens when dialogue within the black community gets pulled into the mainstream, um, where it is stripped of all meaning, gentrified, um, and effectively made meaningless, um, made, made almost the opposite of what it means. A Wrinkle in Time is not Afrofuturistic. I don't know who the hell said that. Um, and so, so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll tell you a story, um, and I have stripped all uh, identifying factors from this. And I've, I told this at BAM like maybe about a month ago, so if any, any of you saw me there, then you'll hear me tell this again. Um, but I got a, a contact from a production company uh, maybe, maybe three or four months ago that uh, let me know that they were interested in uh, doing something Afrofuturistic. Um, so they wanted something about Africa written by a black person in the future. That was effectively the, that was the brief. Um, and I'm like, can you be more specific? Um, and they're like, nope, nope, we, we don't want to interfere with your creative process. Da, 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 da. We want something about Africa written by you in the future. I'm like, well, I've never been to Africa. I ain't from there. I have genetic heritage from there, but unless that genetic heritage can teach me how to write, um, you know, this is, this is not how I, I inherited a tendency for diabetes. I did not inherit <laughs> the ability to understand the, the disparate cultures that my ancestors, who are different parts of the diaspora, derive from. Um, that's not how it works. And, and so, and also, and this is a thing that you can probably speak to, but my perception of Afrofuturism was that it was born out of the diaspora. It was born out of um, a, a, 
the difficulty that post-colonized black people have, and this is not limited by any stretch to the diaspora, um, but the difficulty that post-colonized people have in a world that has persistently and repeatedly told them that they do not have a future, that they don't exist anymore and everybody else is gonna be off above the clouds while we're just vanished um, in Jetson's land. Um, and so where, where you, where the act of thinking of a future or even thinking of different mythic forms, um, past, different, uh, different ideologies that dictate the way that the world becomes in the present, even that, all of that is perceived as radical. Um, simply because having a future, having pasts that aren't given to you by the colonizers um, is radical. So, um, When Afrofuturism starts to mean in the eyes of Hollywood, because this was a Hollywood level thing, when Afrofuturism in the eyes of Hollywood starts to mean Africa plus black people plus future, and that's it, it is stripped of a lot of meaning, let's just say. Um, it's offensively stripped of meaning. Um, I was not the right person to, to, to talk to you about this. I don't know why they called me. They know I'm from Mobile, Alabama and Brooklyn. Um, you know, there's no logical reason for them to have called me other than the fact that they don't understand all black people aren't the same. So, um, you know, and other than the fact that they, they saw Black Panther, saw it made a couple of billion dollars or some, uh, some ridiculous amount of money, um, and, and decided, cash cow, let's call all the black people. That's not the way that this goes. Um, and what will happen as a result, I believe, is simply um, black folks will do what we always do and we will invent new terminology. Um, we will move away from the, the bastardized techno uh, technology, uh, terminology um, as it becomes tainted with the, the expectations of the very people that it is built to fight, ab fight against. Um, we will come up with something new. I don't know if that answers your question or not, um, but that's how I feel about it. This is probably going to be our last oh, question. I'm talking too much, sadly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. And it's not even that like deep. Um, <laughs> you already answered at the, at the very beginning what your writing process was like, and I can completely relate to pretty much all of it, but I kind of wanted to ask what your revision process is like, mm. because that's not as often talked about, and mm. it can be incredibly daunting. I love revisions. I really, yes. Yes, I love revisions. Revisions are when the horrible mess that I have churned through through sleepless nights and lack of food and bad food to create um, starts to look like a book. Um, revisions are, are, are when I actually start to like it. Um, right now, the book that I'm working on right now, I hate this book. <laughs> I don't want to think about it anymore. It's a chore to work on it. Um, but revision is delightful. Um, what I usually do is I, if I have the time, if I'm not already past deadline, um, there are orbit people here. I can't say anything else. I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, um, so, so if I'm not already past deadline, I take a month off. I go do something entirely different. Um, I write something else. Um, I, I go on a trip. I do palate cleansers, basically, to try and let the story cool off in my head. Um, and then I come back to it a month later and I just read through it start to finish, fixing things along the way. Um, sometimes I do that along the way, and sometimes I'll do that immediately after I finish the rough draft, just because I know the rough draft is too rough, um, and, and I'm a Virgo, I have to. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'll read through it start to finish and just fix all the typos and you know the, just basic spackling. Um, but then I take a month off and then I come back to it and that's when I do the, the hardcore renovations. That's when I decide if plot lines need to go, if new chapters need to be added. Um, that's often when I add chapter epigraphs, if I'm gonna do something like the, the epigraphs that were at the end of the chapters in uh, The Broken Earth or the beginnings of the chapters in the Inheritance Trilogy. Um, um, so, and that's when I sometimes reorder chapters entirely. Um, sometimes I delete chapters. Um, sometimes I realize the pace is completely wrong and all the exciting stuff is happening in like the last 10 pages. So then I have to like insert exciting things in the first 10 pages or whatever. Um, and that's fun. Um, it takes two or three cycles of revision to get it to the point where I'm happy with it. But that's what I do. 
Terrific. I'm so sorry. I talk too much. <laughs> no, you talked. Uh, I, we could all obviously listen for another well, several hours. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>